Hello, Miss Stepping. And Marlene uh, or Amy, do we have any sign of Peyton yet? Or? Missy, where are you? Not yet. Okay. I'm in here. No, but are you in the <laughs> hotel or is that? Okay, okay we're ready. You can get down to the room. Putting a virtual background on. I'm in my bedroom. It's just. Guys. <laughs> Even late live now, you can. I was start. hoping you were someplace Good. fun. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I will call this special uh, meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education to order. Pursuant to KRS Chapter 61, notice is hereby given that on April 7th, 2021, the chair of the Fayette County Board of Education called a special meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, April 12th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. The Fayette County Public Schools Board of Education will conduct a virtual meeting on Monday, April 12th at 5 30 p.m. This will be a virtual meeting streamed online. The link for this meeting is fcps.net slash virtual meeting. This is the board's monthly planning work session, but especially called because it's being conducted virtually. Please be advised in the state of proclaimed national emergency and under a similar declaration by the government, it is not currently feasible for the board to provide meeting room conditions in the face of COVID-19, a highly contagious virus that spreads between people who are in close contact. Under these exceptional circumstances in which the Commonwealth of Kentucky is confronting a worldwide pandemic while nevertheless needing to accomplish critical public business, pursuant to KRS 61.840, the Fayette County Public Schools Board of Education will not provide a primary physical location for public viewing and will proceed pursuant to KRS 61.826 with concessions outlined in the Attorney General's opinion OAG 20-05. Thus, the public can access the meeting via the live stream, but cannot be physically present at the meeting. Miss Daly, good evening. Would you please take roll? Good evening. Miss Amy Green? Present. Mr. Tom Jones? Present. Miss Christy Morris? Present. Mr. Tyler Murphy? Present. Miss Stephanie Spires? Present. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Daly. Our planning work session is an opportunity to review the agenda for our action meeting later this month and to allow time for extended presentations and discussions. Uh, we are very excited uh, this month uh, to reinstitute a familiar practice, uh, but it's been over a year since we've uh, been able to do this, of having a teacher, a student, and a classified employee representative at our meeting. Uh, it is my honor tonight to introduce our teacher representative, Ms. Kara Traub who teaches fifth grade at the Promise Academy at Harrison Elementary. Uh, Ms. Traub is in her seventh year of teaching and has served her entire career with FCPS. Ms. Traub helped open the Promise Academy in 2019 after transferring from Breckenridge Elementary where she taught third grade for five years. She is passionate about the success of all students and is a leader in our profession. Ms. Traub frequently participates in district committees and works to help make NTI 2DL a rigorous and engaging experience for our students. She serves on the school advisory leadership team, which provides feedback to administration regarding school initiatives, and she is also a member of the PBIS team. Ms. Traub is a creative artist who developed the current Promise Academy logo. In her spare time, she creates and sells original jewelry on her website and local shows. And our classified employee representative is Carol Graham, who is in her 29th year as a paraeducator at Beaumont Middle School. Carol enjoys the successes of former students and believes all students can learn regardless of their challenges. Ms. Graham loves spending time on her small farm, traveling, hiking, and reading. After working this past year online, she is very happy to be back in class with students and teachers in person. Being a paraeducator brings Ms. Graham much joy, and she believes being a lifelong learner improves everyone's life. She is grateful for her husband of 43 years, their wonderful son, good family, and great uh, friends. Please join me in welcoming our, our distinguished board representatives. Thank you all very much. And feel free again to chime in at any time as we engage in our discussion. We do have um, a student representative this month is uh, Caitlin Foster with the Learning Center. And as soon as she joins us, um, we'll be sure to pause and recognize her. Next on the agenda at this time is an update on our superintendent search. Um, our partners with uh, Greenwood Asher and Associates have sent us an, an update for me to share with you. 
Uh, they want everyone to know, as we know, the position profile and advertisement have been finalized. Uh, it's available for public viewing on the FCPS Superintendent Search website at fcps.net slash search. Um, once on the search page, uh, the hyperlink to the profile is found under the heading latest updates in the search and under the subheading March 22nd. Um, advertisements have been placed in a variety of local, regional, and national media outlets, including, uh, but certainly not limited to, the FCPS website, the Kentucky Educator Placement Service, the American Association of School Administrators, the National Association of School Superintendents, Education Week, K-12 Job Spot, National Alliance of Black School Educators, and the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. We've also placed the advertisement on professional networking sites such as LinkedIn. Recruiting is well underway and the search firm is having regular conversations with both sources, that is people who know people in education. Uh, they make recommendations regarding people who we should reach out to that meet the FCPS qualifications and prospects of people that the firm has identified that meet our uh, qualifications and the criteria of the position. Um, so they're reaching out to sources who are superintendents, Kentucky Board of Education members, uh, people who hold leadership positions in education-focused organizations like the Council of Chief State School Officers, the American Association of School Administrators, National Association of School Superintendents, National Alliance of Black School Educators, the Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents, and of course, the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, Again, they're also reaching out directly to prospects uh, who are superintendents, assistant associate deputy superintendents, chief diversity officers, chief academic officers uh, in urban districts. Uh, they have received a number of applications already. Uh, some individuals have applied in response to the advertisement. Some have applied as a result of outreach following a nomination, and some have applied as a result of direct outreach from our search partners. Uh, applications are coming in from individuals, uh, they tell us, who are sitting superintendents, who are assisting, uh, assistant superintendents, chief academic officers, principals, leaders in educational, uh, nonprofit, and corporate settings as well. We also have a number of prospects uh, that are interested in the position. They've expressed an interest but have not yet applied. Um, they're reviewing the position profile and resource materials provided by the firm to determine whether they would like to actually formally apply. And we will begin screening applications very soon and will continue to accept applications until an appointment is made. So uh, what are some of the next steps here? Um, there are multiple uh, next steps. Uh, the screening committee does uh, really the heavy lifting uh, during this phase of uh, the search the screening committee is meeting next on april 23rd and the plan for that meeting is to review applicant materials against the professional and interpersonal competencies we discussed at our last board meeting uh, identify the individuals they would like to learn more about um, through a competential interview process with the screening committee and then the screening committee interviews are scheduled for the 29th and 30th of april and once screening committee interviews are complete, the committee will determine uh, who they want to learn more about through referencing. So again, lots, <clears throat> lots of uh, info there, but we're kind of in a, in a holding pattern as we're getting applications in. Our search partners are actively recruiting. Anyone can submit a nomination or a recommendation or a referral at fcps.net slash search, and our search partners will reach out to those individuals. So that is the latest update from uh, Greenwood Ashton Associates. Are there any questions from board members um, on this search process? Mr. Murphy, can you clarify a little bit about the next step, like the screening process, like what that looks like? Is that the firm screening and then they provide us with candidates or is that the committee that we have screens all the applicants? Can you just give us a little clarification? Yes, it's a, it's a combination of both. And Ms. Dyer is on here if you want to speak to the particulars of the of the process. Uh, but the search firm does a screening and they share that uh, information with the screening committee who looks at the references, who chooses uh, interviews based on the information they've gotten from the search firm. Uh, Ms. Dyer, is there anything to add to that? 
Uh, not really. I think you've covered that. Um, the search firm will provide them with all of the applicants. They will guide them to those, similar to like a site-based council. Site-based council receives all of the principal applications, and then the um, district designee, which is the chief of school, says, you know, looking at the profile you develop, these top 10 rows to, to to some to to level based on that profile, so a similar thing will happen. And again, the the screening committee will make recommend recommendations to the board, but the board may view all of those applicants as well in that similar process. Yes, and the board will have access to all of the that information. Chairman Murphy, do we do we know the deadline for applications? There is not a hard deadline. What they're saying is that they will accept deadlines until an uh, appointment is made. The, they'll, the screening committee will begin reviewing applications on April 23rd, but it, again, it will be a rolling uh, basis. Is that correct, Ms. Dyer? Yes, Thank sir. You. I looked on the website um, to try to answer that question. It wasn't clear, so that makes sense. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all. Any other questions? Okay. And our uh, partners with Greenwood Asher and Associates will be here at the 26th meeting as well. Um, you know, that'll be after the screening committee's next meeting. And so uh, we'll have additional updates for us then. So uh, we just encourage folks to check out the profile. If you know of anybody that might be interested, refer, um, refer them, so fill out that uh, referral process online and uh, they'll reach out to them. Excellent. And at this time, I will turn the agenda over to Acting Superintendent uh, Dr. Helm to lead us through our action meeting agenda. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Um, before I go over the agenda for this month, I'd like to add my own welcome to uh, members of the public that are joining us and certainly would like to extend a, a heartfelt welcome to Kara and Carol and hopefully to our student, uh, Caitlin, who will hopefully join us before the evening ends. So uh, your voices are important and hopefully um, by the end of the month, after you've attended two meetings, you'll feel very, very comfortable and um, you know, please don't hesitate to chime in and ask questions and offer um, your opinions. So we appreciate your active participation. At our, April meet, at our action meeting on April 26, we will have the reading of the mission statement by board member Christy Morris, followed by the superintendent's report. Tonight, I'd like to just give you just a few brief points uh, as to update you on uh, the work of the CCT. Our rolling seven day average is 30. I have to repeat that. Our rolling seven day average is 30. We were giving numbers like two something just two months ago. Um, so 30 is pretty impressive. So yellow should be our new favorite color, regardless of who you are, where you are, yellow is our new favorite color because that means that we are safely ensconced or at least ensconced um, at a stage that we can feel pretty comfortable about uh, what we've done up to get to this point and where we're going. Um, we know that it's going to take continued work to stay in yellow. So we certainly don't want anyone to veer from the healthy practices that um, they've been following, which has gotten us to this point. All students whose families so chose in person are now back on their respective campuses. So the last group of 20 students returned uh, last Monday. So we are fully back in. Again, another great um, milestone for our district that is only made possible by the efforts, the dedication, the commitment, and the, um, you know, just the determination uh, of everyone in our community. So we thank you for that. You were uh, informed or, or information was shared with you last week that temperature checks for students uh, were discontinued as of last Thursday. We talked about maybe waiting until tomorrow when we actually have our CCT meeting, 
but those temperature checks really are very, were very time consuming. And so we knew with the guidance of CDC and the support of our health department, we just thought since we know we can discontinue them, let's go on and make that announcement. So as of Thursday for students, uh, that was discontinued. The question has come up, what, what are we gonna do with that equipment? You know, all those thermometers, all those uh, temperature scanners and our health department partners are telling us that that equipment will be, uh, will come in very handy when we return to normal, whatever that is and looks like, especially when flu season comes around again. So we may be able to catch um, some um, individuals with high temperatures and maybe get them the medical treatment that they need um, even quicker. So um, that equipment will not go to waste. I will tell you that that equipment was paid for or was made possible by um, the federal government. If, as you know, they were providing dollars for schools and governments and other entities to purchase PPE equipment uh, a year ago. And that equipment was paid for with those dollars. And so we will be good stewards of the equipment until we are, uh, until we use it again, or until we are given some guidance or direction on uh, doing something else with it. But for right now, we are going to um, store it and keep it uh, so we can use it in the future. Covering uh, transportation routes continues to be a challenge. However, I can tell you that we added five new drivers, yay, transportation um, to our contingency this week. And we have a few more that should be coming on board uh, over the next few weeks. We are hoping that we are, we are headed in the right tra trajectory. And later in the meeting, we're gonna be asking you to take action on two additional um, uh, points that we think will help to move us even further along in making sure our transportation contingency is as strong as we need it to be. Our health department continues to monitor the statistics across the county, and we meet with them every Tuesday. We've done this now for, what, five months, um, and they just continue to meet with us. They continue to give us good guidance and uh, provide us with the information that we need, not only for our school district, but for our community as a whole. What I would like to share with the community um, is that now that eligibility has opened up for uh, younger individuals uh, down to age 16, we are certainly encouraging families with eligible age students to seriously consider uh, the vaccine uh, because young people we're finding, we're hearing on the news are uh, you know, even more susceptible or becoming susceptible to uh, the disease. We know that everybody wants to have a, a fun summer and this might uh, put families a little bit more at ease if they know that their teens and tweens um, and young adults have, uh, have been vaccinated. So please go to our website, go to the health department website. We're told that there are enough doses within our community to uh, pretty much, I think, satisfy those families that might choose that for their, um, for their students down to age 16. And then again, we just want to continue to thank um, each and every one of you because this has not been a one person or a one committee um, effort. This has taken, you know, that old adage, this has taken a village. And so we want to thank the teachers for all of their creativity and their stamina and uh, just um, their ability to keep kids engaged, to connect with families. We wanna thank everyone in transportation and food service, uh, our community leaders, our community members, parents who took on um, the role of, of teacher and paraprofessional and supporter and homework monitor. Um, all the other employees, because it isn't just the academic side, as you know, it is the operational side as well. Our food service workers and uh, custodians and all of the other folks that help to make up the FCPS family. Um, our school leaders for their extraordinary efforts. Um, everyone has put so much into getting us to this particular point. 
and we just ask. We're we're 26 days away. It's hard to believe we are 26 days away from bringing the 2021 school year to a close, and we just need everyone to remain vigilant and um, just remain confident that we can do this because we have. And uh, I think that will be a great way to end the year. We're going to have proms. We're going to have graduations. We're going to you know, trickle back into uh, whatever this new normal is. So again, we thank you. And um, that's our that's our brief update for this particular particular agenda. So with that being said, um, let's move to the academic services. One of the things that we know is because of the year that we've had, we're going to need to offer um, additional services this summer for students who need to strengthen their skills to um, do some credit recovery and some other things. And Mindy Mills has, has uh, ignited the fire. She and her team with Kate and others have ignited the fire and they're mm -hmm. gonna be here this evening to tell you even more about Summer Ignite. So I'll, I'll let you and uh, Mindy and Kate take it away. Dr. Helm, thank you so much. Good evening, board members and distinguished guests. Uh, we have an update to share with you on Summer Ignite, and we'll move right along into the presentation. In January, we began a community-wide uh, formation of a, of a committee to help begin studying about summer programming and this committee includes both school level as well as district level leadership. You'll see also on here some of our strong partners, including the Y, our 16th district PTA, the FCEA, as well as our UK friends. This uh, planning committee was the uh, formation of Summer at Night. And I'll share with you in the next slide that this was the goal that was uh, created by this committee for Summer Ignite. And um, it again, board members, just to remind you to provide that robust, rigorous and engaging opportunities for students to accelerate and extend learning in preparation for our upcoming school year. Our planning committee also created some expectations for uh, the summer session in Summer Ignite. And those are listed uh, here again, board members, to remind you to offer Summer Ignite in person. We will be having uh, three sessions to provide that robust and rigorous and engaging learning opportunity and ignite our students into deeper learning, as well as ac accelerate the learning to meet the students where they are and move them forward. Uh, in our Summer Ignite program, we also do expect to see an enhancement of the social emotional well being of our students and to include opportunities to address the physical well being of our students. And finally, to also include opportunities for our family members to be engaged in, this, in the summer learning program of their children. I have the uh, pleasure to introduce Mindy Mills, who I asked to lead the summer programming. Um, Mindy has already been tapped by Superintendent Helm to present back in January uh, about our summer plans. Uh, Dr. Helm and Mindy presented in a, a KDE uh, webinar for all superintendents to hear about what Fayette County was is planning for our summer programming. And I'm just so pleased to note that today we actually had um, some guidance finally provided by KDE on summer learning. And those recommendations are, uh, we are, are right there with them in their plans and in, in their recommendations with our plans. So I share with you that uh, we have great leadership in Mindy Mills. And so welcome, Mindy, and let's hear more about Summer at Night. Thank you, Ms. Mac Ms. McNally, and thank you board members for giving us uh, this time tonight. So I will go through the remainder of our presentation. Um, 
I'm excited to let you know that we currently have 69 summer programs planned for Fayette County and 69 of our schools and our special programs and different things. We knew that to make this a success, especially with the logistics, we needed some parameters. So the district did start with that committee that Ms. McNally mentioned, setting the parameters for the sessions. And so all sessions will follow these dates that you see here in our presentation. Session one and session two will both be 14 days of learning for our students with a break in between, which we really felt like was needed for our teachers and our staff, as well as our students. And then session three will be five days of a jumpstart or transition program. That session will be mainly for our incoming kindergartners going into their new building for the first time, sixth graders moving to the middle school and ninth graders moving to the high school. We also have some opportunity maybe for students that chose to stay remote during the um, th during this semester, may be invited to come into the Summer Ignite program as well, and some of those may attend during that transition time. So we've set the times, our transportation helped us with this, our elementary schools, their Summer Ignite program in each of the three sessions will run from eight to 12. And to give our drivers time and routes and so forth, who they'll be, you know, doing double duty, just like they do on a regular school day now, the middle high school programs uh, and the special programs will run their summer night sessions from nine to one. So those are basically what you would call the bell times, the times for instruction. Obviously, the buses will be dropping off a little bit earlier than that uh, for transportation needs and breakfast and those type things. So those are our dates. Those have been shared with our community. Schools are sharing those with families now and moving forward with identifying students to participate. Amy? So how are we funding this? Um, as you're also aware, and you've heard in previous board meetings, we have what uh, Dr. Helm has, has titled the ESSER core team, who is talking about how our district is going to best use the ESSER funds and Summer Ignite will be funded with our ESSER funds. As we move forward, we do know that it's an allowable expense for any summer learning, any summer school type program, as well as addressing learning loss with evidence-based practices, which is what will be happening throughout our Summer Ignite sessions. So what will the funding cover for Summer Ignite? Obviously the staff stipends, and I'd like to say right now, um, I think the board did the right thing and thank you for allowing that increase in our certified teachers salary for the summer. I think that has helped tremendously. Uh, we are not feeling that struggle right now of not having enough staff to cover our needs. And I think that was a huge asset in that. But it will not only cover stipends for the certified teachers, but also for any support staff. We're working with uh, student support to ensure that we have some staff on board for district mental health and social workers. Uh, we're working with Debbie to make sure that we have some school nurse needs covered. And so, um, as well as EL teachers, special education teachers, interventionists, just all based on each school's needs of what they have to meet the needs of their students that will be attending summer at night. That budget will also cover all of our transportation costs throughout the summer and transportation will be provided to all students within their district parameters. Um, and as well as any of our special programs that are already set up. So as an example, transportation will be provided for our RISE students, even though that their district is a little not as tight as some of our other schools. Breakfast and lunch will be provided for all students. Um, the summer night budget will cover any necessary materials and resources in order to help teachers plan their activities as well as helping with uh, student needs and making sure that they have all the resources needed to have a successful summer. Um, also, we you're, you'll see a list later of all the community partners that we're going to be working with, but the budget will cover all of those contracts and anything that we need to support that need of our community partners. Amy, all right. So we knew that we had to give our school some guidance on who they included um, and who they encouraged, I guess, to attend and who they identified to participate. 
So in session one and session two, our schools are focused on students whose data showed a need for additional learning opportunities. Uh, they wanna accelerate their learning, pick them up where they are and move them forward. So they may be looking at students who have not yet mastered the standards in reading or mathematics. They just need some extra student engagement um, and so forth. And then students who also may need an, an opportunity to extend their learning through inquiry and project-based from having lots of enrichment activities in each of our programs. So those students have been identified. And then our middle and high schools uh, there will be a focus to for some students who have that need for credit recovery. And again, I've already said in session three, that's looking at those transition kids and coming in and taking care of some of their needs to get them on board before the official start of the school year. There's a long list of community partners. Um, I will publicly say a huge thank you to Carrie Rogers and Miranda Scully who have taken over this part of the summer of night planning. Um, by the end of the week, our uh, summer coordinators in each school will get a list and kind of a menu of choices of things that they can pick from to help with their enrichment, to help with their extended activities that will be taking place in, in their summer Ignite program. So excited about all these community partners. And one thing to add, especially about one of those, we just learned today that UK has dozens of pre-service teachers on board to support summer Ignite. And when I mean dozens, we're hoping like it's enough for, for myself with Dr. Margaret Schroeder to be able to assign maybe two people to each building, just to be extra hands on deck to help with small group instruction or whatever might be needed. And what an opportunity for those teachers. Um, they not only will get paid for that experience, but also they will be able to count it as some observation hours and some um, hours for their education as they move forward. All right, so where are we right now? Igniting the flame, just because I felt like I needed a catchy title there. It's really just next steps. Um, as Kate mentioned, each of our schools has submitted a proposal that was approved by their SBDM council. Um, all of those proposals have either been now reviewed and approved, or just a few of them, I mean, just very few, were sent back with some questions and comments and how think about this, so they're in the process of doing some revisions. But I have to say, my heart was warmed with every proposal I read because our students are gonna be so excited. You know, every proposal involved academics and enrichment and all the things you see listed there, community partnerships, how are they gonna meet the SEL needs of their students, family engagement, specific student needs for special education for EL students, and our schools, along with their summer coordinator and their team that they've put together to write that proposal have just done, have gone above and beyond anything I've expected. And I'm saying, you know, many schools will be offering STEM type activities. Many are doing things with outdoor classroom. Many have a focus on the, like a literacy camp type initiative. It's, it's just a little bit different at every school, but it is truly based on the needs of that school and what they feel the needs of their students are. And I think one thing that is also extremely exciting is, you know, we mentioned that one of the considerations for including students was credit recovery. I can firmly say that even those students who may be coming in to recover a credit will also have the opportunity for enrichment and engagement during the time that they are in their building. And that's something that's totally different than anything we've ever had before. Um, so I really think that it's just exciting and it's gonna be a great summer for all those kids who are participating. So right now our schools are currently in the process of contacting families and securing that commitment for participation. And then we'll be finalizing our staff list with those schools. Um, lots of other things happening that you don't really need to know about. You don't need to know when the due dates for transportation are and all that stuff, but um, we just feel like it's on the right track and we're moving forward. So um, that's all we have and we will certainly take time to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Mindy, and thank you, Kate and board members, questions? Let me just say I appreciate you acknowledging um, the enrichment opportunities because usually when we talk about uh, programs like this, that tend to only be about remediation. 
Mm -hmm. um, that, that seems to be all it's about. Um, but and this is a key part of the social emotional piece as well, right? That you're creating enrichment opportunities for every student who participates. So I really appreciate that. Um, well, how are we planning as far as um, just ensuring that all of our families are aware of the opportunity and that we're reaching everybody? Um, is that something that we're um, supporting schools and doing, uh, but, but ensuring that every family has knows what the program is, knows what we're offering, and, and is able to make an informed um, decision about what, what their opportunities might be for their child. Right. Um, each school, you know, we have supported them in providing them with templates, applications, flyers, different things that they can customize with their school name and send out to their families. So um, that's being supported through the district and having all of those um, pieces of information translated as needed. Um, I think at this point, you know, they're just, they, they've made their initial list of who they want to ensure that they contact, but we really feel like we're going to have plenty of staff to meet the needs of everyone that wants to participate. Excellent. Thank you. I have just a couple comments and questions. Um, Ms. Murphy, I think your question was it was dead on. As a parent that has kids at multiple elementary schools, I will say it is not consistently being advertised and the surveys are not consistent kind of, you know, there was one survey that I thought was glowing and one survey that I thought like, I wish I could send them this other survey. Um, so, I mean, I think that is something um, the staff may want to kind of reach back out and make sure um, that, um, it is being done, but I do know I've, you know, I've had parent teacher conferences at all my kids schools in the past weeks and I think it has been brought up in that and so I think teachers are doing a really good job like you said reaching out to the students who qualify for it and meet for it but um, the one thing I want to just um, also add on that point is I have had several families reach out concerned about is this going to turn into targeted services like we had back in the fall. And what I really want to say to families is this is completely different. Mm -hmm. It is not, there is a, like what you just showed, there is some criteria for who we're targeting, but you know, it's not the kindergartners are going to go at this school and the ELL students are going to go at this school. And, you know, and, and as a board, we had concerns and we even acknowledge we may have pushed because we kind of said we wanted targeted services plus and we wanted to get as many kids in as possible. And then that kind of led to some inequities. And so, um, you know, we were in the process of reevaluating that when unfortunately COVID did um, get worse and we had to shut down. The governor shut us all down. But mm -hmm. I want to make sure the parents know that this is not that this that is not this is like what you all said, it's enrichment. And what I have seen from the schools, I mean, it's like summer camp. Like, oh, I want to go. Like, they're talking about, like, these outdoor classrooms and these um, STEM activities. And, and it just really seems like a neat opportunity in a way to keep our students engaged. So I do hope families will take advantage of it. Um, I do know it is a challenge, you know, with the half days and some other things. Um, and some schools are even working on some creative um solutions there to help families too. So um, that's really the big thing because I have had several families reach out about concerns and I want to make sure families know this is not targeted services. This is, um, and it's not traditional summer school like we think about. This is not remediation. This is to continue learning and to continue engaging our students and to continue to get them excited about being in the classroom. And then the only other thing I wanted to add is just on the transportation piece, especially because you mentioned RISE, students are eligible, but they still have to be eligible for transportation. I think that was, so like, for example, not all RISE students would have transportation because some would not qualify for transportation. Right. So I just want to make sure that families understood that and didn't recognize um, that you still have to qualify for the transportation. But within the parameters, if you do during the school year, you will for summer and night as well. Right. And Thank um, you. Board member Spires, that's a good point to bring up because we actually just had a question today about so if you if you live somewhere that is typically a walker to your school, then it will continue to be a walker in the summertime, right? You know, so those policies and those things that we do during the normal school year are just going to have to continue um, with the summer. And you know, we've just got our fingers crossed, and um, Mr. Thompson can chime in if he needs to. But we think we're going to be okay with drivers for the summer, but we're we're hoping so. So. 
And uh, we are excited too. I think I can share that um, food service is looking at kind of employing a couple people from their staff in each building so that hopefully some buildings will actually have a hot meal maybe one day a week or maybe even two days a week. And so that's exciting as well. Um, just moving forward with lots of planning, but lots still to do. I just want to say thank you. You, the team, all of you all have worked really hard and, you know, it's with everything else you've all had going on. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'd not um, to fit you all. Go ahead. Mr. Murphy, I had a question or two also. Uh, you had said in the presentation that you would meet students where they are and move forward. Yeah. Can you elaborate on exactly what that means and how you will meet students where they are and move, move them forward? Absolutely. So, um, you know, we have lots of, we are data rich in Fayette County, as we know. Um, and one way is to use our Galileo data or map data or end of year benchmark assessments that, students, that teachers will have access to. Uh, we are gonna put together kind of like an individualized learning plan for each student. And before the teachers go home for the summer, we're gonna ask them just to complete a short little survey of um, Debbie is gonna be coming to Summer Ignite. These are some things we suggest that she might need to work on or so forth. But don't think that's remediation because really that's acceleration. That's picking that student where they are and moving them forward as much as we can during the summer so that they're even more prepared for the next school year. Um, so that's what we mean, accelerating them, not holding them back, not teaching them things that they already know, just meeting them where they are and moving forward. And that can also be done, we think, because we're trying to keep our, our class sizes extremely small, you know, a, a ratio of about 15 to one, if not less in some buildings. Um, so we think we can do that as much as we possibly can. Uh, can you send me uh, the KDE recommendations that you mentioned earlier? Yes, I'll be glad to. I would like to see those. Yes. And also you had mentioned uh, student support services, uh, but that was not in the PowerPoint. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? Is that something that's still yet to be determined or do no. we know? Um, I guess it was listed in the PowerPoint as SEL, social emotional learning. So mm -hmm. it's twofold. Um, teachers will be doing an SEL type lesson and different things with their students throughout the summer. But we also will have guidance counselors, social workers, district mental health specialists available either in the building or on call just at a building next door to provide students with some counseling services or trauma-informed care, anything that may be needed throughout the, throughout the sessions. So is that standard across all 69 programs or will that vary? All 69 programs and if Mr. Adams is here, if you wanna to add to my conversation, but all 69 programs will have availability. They may not have someone full time, like they may not have a district social worker for all 33 days of the summer, but they will have access to one that could come to their building if needed to meet a student's needs. Okay. And that's the same, uh, Mr. Jones, that's also the same for school nurses. Mm -hmm. There's a okay. that service is available, uh, but th uh, they will be shared uh, between you know, at least two schools. Okay. And can you provide some examples of the kinds of services that the community partners will be providing? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a little better understanding of what they're going to be, how they'll be contributing. Right. Okay. So um, absolutely. Let's start with uh, something like the Lexington Children's Theater. They are putting together a, a menu of options that uh, may involve coming to as many buildings as they can get to, to do a workshop type situation, maybe do a performance and then a short workshop afterwards. Um, we have another community partner uh, that may be putting together, that are putting together additional type, come in and do uh, some STEM activities with the students. 
Uh, we are fortunate enough that Ms. Johns in our technology department is also um, making available the STEM, not the bus itself, because that's a little not COVID friendly still right now, but the, the teachers that work on the bus will still be coming into the buildings to provide some enrichment and support activities. Um, just different things I think that will be a lot of options. We have some community partners. You've probably heard of Divine uh, Karma who does some great guest speaking and, and guest speakers who will be available uh, for schools to choose from to kind of set up some different things that they could have available throughout the summer. Um, how will we know if the Summer Ignite program has been successful? How will we know that the investment that we're making in this um, has yielded the benefit that we very desperately need for it to yield? Absolutely. Um, well, as far as when it comes to data, we will definitely be looking at our spring map data compared to our fall map data. Um, we are still researching and looking at really if we want to look at doing a pre and post test for those students who actually come that's that's been very difficult in the past because not all students will attend the same number of days but we can look at spring fall or spring map to fall map to see if there was an improvement or at least really we're hoping for not a lot of regression right to for students to maintain and possibly grow over the summer. We will be doing survey data with families. We'll be doing, um, our, our partners at UK are also helping with a little plan to kind of daily survey students. You know, what went well for you today? What do you wish we had done, done differently? And then we're gonna talk with our teachers and some professional learning, how they could use that on a daily basis, maybe to change what they do the next day. So some formative assessment type things that will be happening. Um, and then always our attendance data as well. Um, our, our former superintendent, Manny, used to always say, hey, they're better coming into our building and doing something than they are just running the streets or being at home. So, you know, our goal, again, is to provide that opportunity for our students to continue their learning over the summer. Well, I would like to encourage that, um, that the evaluation of the program's effectiveness be something that we uh, give uh, careful consideration to, but with that in mind, um, have we made any assessment yet of the extent to which, or the degree to which we are, the, the, some sort of a, of a parameters on the learning loss? Do we have any, any idea at this point of, of the challenge that we're facing regarding learning loss? A good question, uh, Mr. Jones. We we do have uh, just classroom data at this point. Our next um, interim assessment would be our spring map, which would which would, would encapture all of the students' uh, grades K through eight to give a better answer for you. I think we chatted about that uh, maybe a month or so ago in a previous meeting. Um, uh, but mostly, what we're seeing now is coming from the classroom data. Okay. And, and so the summer, summer at night program would be one part of a more comprehensive program to address this. Is that correct? To address learning. Oh, goals. yes. The summer at night program would not be the only uh, initiative uh, established for um, results of challenges due to the pandemic. That is true. That is true and correct. And I also need to say that our school-based decision-making councils are all involved in helping to design these plans because they do base their program uh, plans on the needs of the students. And those councils all have parents as well as teachers working with the instructional leader of the building as the chair. So even back during targeted services, those plans were designed based on the needs of the children of the school and the council was involved in reviewing, providing feedback and input and plans. So those needs that are showing up from last fall in those targeted services, they were based on data personalized 
from the school. And the same is following through again this summer with the Summer at Night program. All of the um, plans that Mindy mentioned earlier were all designed with many staff members and parents involved, as well as the council approving that plan before it was submitted to um, the district office. So yes, they are based on needs, but they're based on needs within their schools, within their schools. And they are designing their plan on how they see as a unique and enrichment type way to address those needs. Is it your sense? Very different. I can't tell you enough how, how unique these plans are, but they're, they're okay. very creative with the enrichment included. Yeah, uh, Ms. McAnally, my yes. concern is that the learning gap that we've been talking about for 30 years is going to turn into the learning Grand Canyon. Do, is it your sense that the school councils and the staffs at the schools that you're working with understand that our learning gap could explode and that the summer at night and that our efforts moving from this point forward uh, are critical in trying to uh, uh, minimize what could be a, an enormous gap in learning that we've never experienced anything like that. But I, mean, I don't want to overstate it, but I really feel like the concern in, in, uh, that I've heard from others across the country is that the learning gap could be so substantial that it would uh, create a huge challenge for us. Is it, your under, is it your sense that the staff in the schools, the school councils appreciate uh, the challenge that we may be facing with this? So, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, I believe that because of our high quality staff that we have in our schools, they sense this March 13th, 2020. This isn't something that, that they had as a concern today. This was a concern that began last spring. And I believe that our staff in Fayette County Public Schools, because we have such strong, a strong teacher workforce in Fayette County Public Schools, that we have begun last, last year working on as many opportunities as we could to continue that learning process and progress through the year, even though we had to teach remotely for several months and teachers dug in and they worked together and they worked harder than they ever have before. Many of them continue to work very, very hard right now in a remote as well as face-to-face -face setting. And I believe that th this hard work will reduce the learning challenges. Do I believe we have learning challenges? Yes, we do. But do I believe that our workforce is, is um, working forward and moving to meet the needs of every single child? That's what's happened now. We're becoming much more of a personalized learning staff. Mm -hmm. We are not just looking at the middle and teaching to the middle anymore. Right. We're personalized our learning so much more. So when you see classrooms today, they do look different. And it's not just because some of the kids are in a remote setting. They look different because the learning is now more personalized. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I don't see how we'll ever yes, sir. Get, uh, move. I don't see how we'll ever address this unless it is more personalized. And yes, that we sir. move away from whole group instruction. Yes, sir. And uh, well, we had can, a, we can had I chime in to help us with that? So very good questions. And we will continue to make sure, uh, board members, that you continue to receive updated reports on our learning challenges. I think that's a very important uh, topic to continue to have that conversation with you. Well, Stephanie, let me just say one more thing, if you would allow me, Ms. Fires. It, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for the work that you've done on the summer at night program. It sounds very exciting. It sounds very interesting. I, I think that you have done a great job in making this an attractive opportunity for, for children. 
and for all of our students. And I'm very uh, appreciative of that effort. Thank you. So Ms. Spires, go ahead. I was just going to chime in. I've talked to several schools. I know that SBDMs have been meeting and, um, and just to kind of give a personalized touch to what Ms. McNally, Ms. Was, Ms. McNally was saying, um, you know, I think we won't really know till we get the map data and the map testing is all going on the next week or two um, in the, over the upcoming weeks. But I think the feedback I'm getting is that, you know, that teachers are pleasantly surprised that students are moving forward and they are engaged and they are back into it. And I think that's the biggest thing about summer night is students are bummed that the school year is about to end. So they have this opportunity. But one of the things just to kind of give an example other than summer at night that I've seen some schools doing is that if they have classes like what you were talking about, where certain students maybe need more attention, they're looking at their staffing and, and teachers are staying. So like your fourth grade teacher may stay and be your fifth grade teacher. Um, and that's just one of the examples that I have seen um, where we're looking at this individualized and that's not across the district and that's, but that's just some of the innovative things I think that the schools are doing at the school-based level in addition to summer night and some of the other things. So I just wanted to share um, what I've seen and what I've kind of observed over the past few weeks. Would this be a good time for me to chime in from that? Yes, in fact, Ms. Trowell, I was just going to ask you and Ms. Graham if you all had anything to add to this, since you are on the ground and seeing this firsthand. Absolutely. Yeah, so I wanted to touch um, on the um, board member Tom Jones said something about how can we make sure that our investment, like how can we make sure that we are getting our return our, on our investment? So I, just, I also want to echo what um, some of the other board members have been saying about how Fayette County is data rich. We do have data. And as long as I've been in Fayette County in my seven years of education, it's always been about data, data, data. And data is so important. It's one of those pieces that you really can't see growth without. However, this gap that we're talking about, um, it's not going to become wider per se, because we are all in a pandemic globally. Um, so the gap is not necessarily getting larger because everyone has the gap. Now, of course, that is not applicable to people with low SES or other um, groups that may be racial disparities or things like that. Obviously, people are affected differently in different ways. Um, however, the sense of urgency that teachers are feeling has never been greater. We know exactly where our kids are because, like I said, we it is a data-rich county. And um, additionally, what students are not going to get back is a summer of isolation. Um, I teach fifth grade. My students are 10. If they don't go to school this summer, that will be 20% of their summers that they've been alive that they have not been able to even have opportunities for learning, social emotional learning, um, incidental learning that happens as you're you know taking a walk with your class. Oh, what's that plan? These things. Um, Kids are resilient. They will continue learning. They will absorb whatever is put in front of them. And summer school just seems like a logical first step. I appreciate uh, those comments and I appreciate all of the questions, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's important, as uh, Board Member Jones said, of, you know, having, okay, what are our standards of success and then monitoring that. And, that, and that's one of, you know, that's part of the art of teaching, right? Uh, where we're constantly formatively assessing. Um, where we, we see um, the children in front of us and we're responding to their needs in, in ways that are uh, both driven by data, what we traditionally think of as data, but there's also non-traditional data, just that, that formative, um, uh, objective observations that we're making as educators. Um, but um, th this is certainly, uh, to Board Member Jones's point and to Ms. Uh, Traub's point, is going to be a conversation uh, that's going to be ongoing and it's going to be work that's going to be on, ongoing. And it, and it comes down to that. You know, we always say pictures in the classroom. It comes down to that, that classroom level. And, and, and what can we do as a board team to support that work and, and the success of our educators uh, as they help students through this time and as we support them through this challenging time as well. Any other questions or comments for this team? All my questions as I wrote them down, um, my colleagues took them, which is fantastic. Uh, I just want to echo um, everyone's thankfulness 
really, you know, I, I'm so grateful and thankful for everyone's hard work, everyone that was listed on that committee and, and people beyond that, because I know every person on that committee, I'm sure reached out to five other people or 10 other people and those people reached out to people. Um, and so I just want to echo publicly, thank you to everyone in all of Lexington for really helping make this uh, a program. And I really look forward to this innovation continuing in the classroom and in the community. And so um, I will keep it short, but thank you. And Summer Ignite too, to emphasize is just is a piece, right? We're not saying that this is this is the uh, going to solve all of our COVID issues, right? This is a piece uh, of a much long, longer puzzle. Uh, Board Member Morris, did you have something? I just wanted to say thank you as well. And I definitely appreciate Ms. Traub's comments. Thank you for speaking up and, and sharing your ideas and your thoughts. It was really helpful and I appreciate it. Um, I'm excited about the program. Um, and I, I think most parents will be. So I'm, I'm just very appreciative and thank you guys. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's important for us to remember as well that the 2021 school year was a school year. It was different, but teachers were teaching and students were learning and support was being offered. It wasn't the year that we envisioned. It isn't the year that we would have crafted if we had an opportunity to craft a atypical year for our, for our students. Um, but students did learn. And I think teachers are, are finding out that in some cases, students are not as far off the mark as maybe some might think. And so they're using this time to figure out what, where they need support and how to give that support so that they're ready for um, the next challenge. And I think what you'll hear also as we come forward with um, uh, recommendations from the ESSER um, core team is that there will be other opportunities for us to step up and help children, you know, um, after the new school year begins, maybe some tutoring and um, after school programs that look a little different than they have in the past. So I don't think this is just a, a you know, a brief period of time for students to try to catch up or to you know strengthen because in some cases it is just strengthening they got the concept it just isn't as strong as it needs to be uh, to move forward so um, again Kira thank you for all that you do and for for speaking up and sharing the perspective straight from uh, the classroom I would love to there. add oh go ahead Oh, no, go ahead, Ms. Brooks. I would love to just add one more thing to just kind of ease everyone's nerves. We're all here for one purpose. It's all about kids. We want kids to get smarter. I want to echo what um, Dr. Helm said. Kids are learning, but then also just to um, the, the uh, gaps. We're filling the gaps while also teaching the on grade level content. And it's all happening within the school day. So whole group is pretty much gone. Of course, we're still going to teach a whole group lesson. But um, just with the latest like thinking and the latest developments in education, we aren't, we aren't teaching to the middle. It's not like we're opening a book and reading it and hoping everyone gets it. For the most part, we are teaching small group, small group, small group all day long. Mm -hmm. targeted instruction. It's not something that we're doing outside of the school day. It's not something new or special. It's something I've been doing as long as I've been in Fayette County and kids' needs are being met in that way. Thank you, and, and speaking of our students, um, I am delighted to welcome our student representative who has joined yes. us now, uh, Caitlin <laughs> Foster. So Dr. Helm, if I may, I'll uh, just sure. interrupt briefly to introduce uh, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin is uh, an 11th grader at the Learning Center. Uh, Center. Principal Chris Salyers shares that she is a standout student who was student of the month in February and helps with PBIS and other student planning activities. And Caitlin is also a leader who shows great enthusiasm in learning and takes great pride in her grades. She plans to attend a four-year university to pursue a career in music therapy. So Caitlin, welcome uh, to our board meeting. And again, feel free to chime in if you have any uh, comments uh, to add. We're glad to have you here. Yes, welcome, Caitlin. Yes, we're so glad you're with us. And again, we thank uh, Kate and Mindy for, and their teams for, I mean, they jumped on this and had 
you know, we were told about this um, and it, it seemed like 10 days later, Mindy had the whole thing laid out, had a committee, had plans, had forms, had, you know, um, such as someone said, um, we were asked to actually present to all of the superintendents um, in the Commonwealth because our program was um, recognized fairly quickly that uh, we had done a lot of work. So that uh, that work and all those efforts and that um, uh, creativity, uh, we thank Mindy and we thank each and every school leadership team and the teachers because the, those 69 plans were not developed by central office. Those 69 plans were developed by each individual school looking at what they needed for their particular um, students, the students that they felt needed a little extra boost or um, help or uh, support to really master and, and cement what they have been learning all year. So we thank each of those schools and we thank all of the teachers and support staff that have agreed to teach and work this summer because this has been a tough year. Uh, that's why I said they, these teachers and others have really worked this year. And if you've ever taught online, um, it is a challenge. You and and you're teaching online, and you know, um, you, you know, you've got asynchronous and synchronous. And these these teachers and support staff have really worked very very hard. So we thank you for all that you did to get us through the 2021 school year and for stepping up and being willing to uh, return this summer, even if you're not doing all three sessions. I don't think I'd do all three sessions, Mindy, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, to step up and, and to you know support because they know what the students need and the students um, are needing these teachers who have this experience and background to, to take us to the next step. So again, thank you so very, very much. Uh, at our action meeting on the 26th, the superintendent's report will also include, as it typically does, the monthly construction progress report. Um, Myron Thompson, our chief operating officer, and Melinda um, are both available if you have any questions for, um, for them at this time. Usually you don't, and so um, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you, uh, Dr. Helm. Next on our agenda is the approval of routine matters. At this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the March 22nd, 2021 regular meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education. Is there a motion to that effect? We'll make a motion uh, to approve the minutes from the March 22nd, 2021 uh, board meeting. A uh, motion by board member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Morris, uh, any discussion? Okay, the question is on approval of the March 22nd, 2021 uh, meeting minutes. Uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Meeting opposed? Motion carries 5-0. At this time, I'll turn the agenda back over to Dr. Helm. Thank you, Chair Murphy. Next on the agenda for the April 26th meeting will be our consent items. Um, the first item is our uh, award of bids and proposals, and Myron Thompson and uh, John White are available if you have any questions about that. The next item is a placeholder for post approvals, and Rodney Jackson, our uh, Finance, Accounting, and Benefits Service Director, will report at that meeting and um, will give you the details of that. If you have any questions about special and other leaves of absences, Rodney will also be available to respond to that uh, as well. And then the uh, next eight items are all construction related. So uh, we are constructing away and uh, Chief Operating Officer uh, Myron Thompson, I think, uh, sent you a memo last week with additional information about these items. And so if you do have any questions, uh, Myron is available to um, to address those. If not, we would move to our action items. Um, we have three items for your consideration and action tonight. Uh, we don't like to, you know, 
put too many action items on the planning, but uh, sometimes circumstances provide us with time sensitive items that we do need to address. So the first item uh, this evening is um, professional leave uh, by district personnel and human resources director Jennifer Dyer is available if you have any questions about those items. Any questions for Ms. Dyer? If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the professional leave as indicated. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to, sorry, I lost my page. Approve the professional leave. Yes, to approve the professional leave as indicated. Excellent. I have a motion by board member Morris. Is there a second? Second. A second by board member Green. Any discussion? Okay, the question is on approval of professional leave as indicated. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board members. Uh, also, this evening, we are seeking your approval of the 2021 through 2025 draft district facility plan and hearing officer. And uh, at this time, I will ask uh, Chief Operating Officer Myron Thompson to share a little bit more uh, with you about this request. This is kind of a uh, not a routine kind of item. Myron. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Uh, actually, this is a four year planning process uh, that is broken up into two bienniums and every school district in the state of Kentucky is required to follow uh, this format. Uh, there is a 20 person committee uh, that has been working on our district facility plan, uh, which will outline sort of our construction priorities for the next four years. Uh, again, building analysis, inventories, pricing and construction uh, prioritization is all part of this. And basically, uh, we should have had this wrapped up in this month, but we just received our information back from the Department of Education um, last month. And so our schedule has now moved and we are trying to get on the June uh, State Board of Education, uh, which is required to approve this. And there is a 45 day submittal uh, required for them for their meetings. So uh, that's why we would ask the board to take action tonight is to sort of keep that timeline and to keep this uh, process moving forward. And uh, there was a draft copy of the plan uh, for the board's review. And I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Any questions for Mr. Thompson? So, uh, Mr. Thompson, at any point, does this come back to us for uh, consideration again? Or is this our only opportunity to uh, review it or to have input? Uh, well, Mr. Jones, actually, uh, once you approve Melinda as the hearing officer, there is one public hearing left that we would get some additional public input, and then the plan would come back to the Board of Education for its approval. Now, once that plan is approved by the board, any of the projects that move forward off of that plan still have to be approved by the Board of Education. So this does not prescribe that this is exactly how the plan will roll forward. It's just identifying our needs as a district in terms of what we plan to do and what the unmet facility needs are. And then whenever a project will come forward, uh, there is a standardized set of forms, the building and grounds, you see BG1, BG2, BG3, that has to be submitted to the full Board of Education uh, for consideration and approval. So you will approve every project on that plan before any money is uh, spent. I just wanna say thank you. I um, And to let you board, my, maybe the new board members know, this committee, is a committee of 20 that meets a lot. Like this is not a committee that you sign up for that you, I mean, there are times when they're meeting two or three times a week over several. So the, I, I really wanna, again, thank our community volunteers that sit on this committee and those that um, volunteered with it, but it is, it is quite the process. So it is not just this committee meets once and puts this group together. I mean, it is a very intense process. Thank you, Ms. Spires. And the the requirements do require us to have parent reps, teacher reps, uh, district uh, building administrator reps, uh, community leaders, uh, a board member, and a local planning and zoning official. So it's a pretty broad uh, committee with various perspectives, and we appreciate your service on the committee as well. Thank you. Any any other questions or comments for Mr. Thompson? If not, then a motion is in order to approve the proposed draft district facility plan for the 2021-2025 biennium 
recommended by the local planning committee and approve Melinda Joseph Dizarn, AIA, the Director of Facility Design and Construction for SCPS as the hearing officer for the public hearing, subject to the approval of the Kentucky Board of Education per the provision of 702 KAR 4180. You need not repeat all of that. Um, I will entertain a motion uh, to that effect. I will make a motion to that effect. Board Member Green makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Spires. Any discussion on the motion to approve the uh, proposed district facility plan draft and appoint a hearing officer? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board members. Our next item is one that also falls under the responsibility of our chief operating officer, and that is the request to reconvene the local planning committee or the LPC uh, to make a minor change to the current uh, district facility plan. So again, I will turn it over to Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Helm. And this item actually is tied to the action that you just took before. As indicated, <laughs> we had hoped to have the entire plan approved uh, at this meeting and it would have included a larger middle school than what was on the 2017 plan. But since we will not have that plan officially done, the Department of Education has asked us to basically modify the previous plan to upsize uh, the middle school on Polo Club Boulevard that we've already submitted the BG1 for uh, from 900 to 1200 students. Uh, we know that middle school uh, is experiencing tremendous growth and uh, our newest schools tend to have um, a lot of um, excitement and a lot of interest in those schools and we have overcrowding it seems like the moment we open the doors so this is just having a little foresight and trying to have a larger building as we move forward in this growth area of the community and that was brought before the current um, lpc who was in agreement with that decision so basically this would allow us to continue to move forward for the new middle school on polo club with a opening of uh, august of 2023 and this helps us keep our timeline Any questions for Mr. Thompson? I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say the new capacity of the middle school would be? Uh, 1,200. Isn't that kind of unusual for us to have a middle school of 1,200? Uh, we have Hayes currently at 1,200 and we have um, portable classrooms there, uh, Mr. Jones. Okay. We have uh, over 1,000, upwards of 1,100 at Jesse Clark. Uh, we have over a thousand at um, Leestown uh, currently. So uh, it is fairly large for a middle school, but it is not atypical. That actually leads to my question, which I don't know if this is the right moment, but it's funny. I actually got this emailed to me today and this may be Mr. Hill as well. Our middle schools are busting, as we know. They all have we have several portables at Winburn and Jesse Clark. And um, you just mentioned the numbers at many of them. This school is not coming online for two years. Are we um, in a situation like what the person asked me today specifically was like kindergarten registration where we had a few years ago where you had to get out that first day in February and be in line to get your kid into kindergarten, which is no longer an issue. But are we going to have middle school issues? Are there other things that we need to do? Because um, we know we really need to kind of redistrict and we're waiting to redistrict for the school, but in this next biennium, what I mean, parents are parents are nervous. Teachers are nervous. We're nervous. So I guess my question is, what? Um, and this isn't exactly to this, but it, the timing is 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 great because it got asked. Sure, uh, I'll let Steve weigh in, Board Member Spires. But again, we we tried to address this issue through portable classrooms, which is a short term strategy. And again, bringing this new middle school online will give us an opportunity to redistrict and to sort of fix it long term. So I think between now and 2023, and we have some additional portable classrooms on the agenda tonight for Leestown. So uh, being able to uh, get those classrooms at Winburn and those other places should allow us to have uh, the capacity for the next two years until that redistricting happens. That's what I would echo as well. That's what I was gonna say. We use portables, uh, learning cottages as our, as our approach for short-term short uh, solution, so. And hopefully one of these days we'll get census data. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Thank you all. Any other questions for Mr. Thompson? Okay, if there are no further questions, a motion is in order to approve the request to reconvene the local planning committee to consider increasing the capacity for the new middle school at Polo Club Boulevard from 900 to 1200 students, which is a minor change to the current 2017 district facility plan per the finding process described in section 503 of 702 KAR 4180, the school facilities planning manual. Again, no need to repeat all that, but is there a motion to that effect? I'll make a motion. A motion by board member Spires, a second by board member Morris. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, the question is on the uh, change or the request to reconvene the LPC to make that population change. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. That was the last of our action items for this evening, but we do have eight items for discussion, each of which will we will be asking you to take action uh, at our regular board meeting on the 26th. So we will start with uh, the assurances for ESSER 2. And Ann Sampson Grimes is here to share more information about that. Ann? Good evening, board members, um, board chair, Mr. Murphy. Um, the assurances is required by the Kentucky Department of Education in order to approve a plan and utilize the funds in accordance with the federal regulations as monitored by the Kentucky Department of Education. This is just a formal document to um, accept the ESSER funding reimbursement that the district will receive after expending those funds. A spending plan will follow um, and be entered into the um, system called GMAP that the Kentucky Department of Education uses in order to approve the spending plan. Any questions? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Ann. Uh, and we will come forward uh, to you with the uh, an ESSER plan in May so that you will uh, then we'll connect these two um, items and get those submitted to KDE. The next item is a new Frisky uh, assurances and um, Director of Student Support Services Doug Adams is going to provide additional details about the possibility of open opening a new Frisky Center to serve students and families. Mr. Adams. Yes, um, the the We've had the opportunity to apply for a new Frisk Center at our last qualifying school, which is Brenda Cowan Elementary. We also have a school that has one center that has served three schools. We are pulling one of those centers off of that school. So the Brenda Cowan will be partnered with Veterans Park. Um, we were originally told this wasn't an option, but um, funding increased. So they opened it up for a very rapid turnaround. Let me know if you have questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. That's exciting. Um, the next item is uh, one that's caused us all to have a, a little moment of, 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 you know, of what's next. But uh, Steve Hill has managed to just get this down to a fine science. He's going to explain to us about Senate Bill 128 and what it means for our school district. Uh, this is brand new legislation that just came out of the um, legislative session that just ended. So Steve, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Helm, I appreciate it. Um, it's uh, always fun to have a good challenge in front of you and uh, this <laughs> is, uh, learning the ins and outs of the Senate bill has been exciting and uh, enlightening. So uh, tonight, I would, if you could share, Amy, the next screen, please. Tonight, I'm, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the impact of um, or the intent of what Senate Bill 128, uh, which went uh, into effect right prior to spring break, as uh, when it was signed by our governor. So we just kind of want to give you a broad overview, an umbrella approach of what, what it is, what we're doing with it. Um, and our next steps. So that's what our goal is for tonight. And then on May 10th, we will bring you the data in which we'll collect. And then on um, May 24th, I believe it is, is when we'll ask for the board 
to to make a, a, a final decision to so take action. Yeah. to take action so um tonight so what is bill, senate bill 128 it's um impacts our families of kindergarten through 12th grade students uh that are enrolled currently in the 2020-21 year the the bill was um established to provide potentially for those that for fa families and guardians who wanted to uh request a supplemental school year it's called the supplemental school year program uh, to do a, a do over year. In other words, there's a one year emergency regulation that was uh, uh, passed by our legislatures and signed by the governor um, for families who felt as if um, they had some, you know, social emotional concerns for their children, academic concerns, whatever it might be uh, to do a do over year. Um, and that was, um, so they called the supplemental school year program. The why behind it is it allows students to retake or supplement courses or grades that students have already taken. So there was a misnomer out there that maybe students could stay back and take uh, additional courses or cert certifications from some, from some from some of our CTE programs. That's not really the intent of this. It's really to to retake courses in which the students had taken the prior prior year uh, before, which is currently this year. Um, so if you could um, forward that. Here's a little bit of a timeline that takes you up to this week. Now we have a timeline even after this, but um, the bill was signed and, and on March 24th, we had a first stakeholder meeting, which uh, I gathered elementary, middle and high uh, principals, chiefs. We wanted to get the input just initially. Now, honestly, this was probably a little before we had all of our information because but we wanted to get a, a quick meeting call before spring break, which was just two days after this, the bill was signed by the governor. Um, and then just right after spring break, we received uh, guidance and answer a lot of our questions from the Kentucky Department of Education on April 5th. Um, the CCT team reviewed th that information on April 6th. We also had a meeting with our communication department. Um, this morning, I had another meeting with the st st same stakeholder uh, group with, with our principals because we wanted to make sure that we shared with them what the uh, new guidance said. Um, and then, uh, of course, we're presenting to you. And then on April 14th, we're going to we're going to speak to all uh, and get the input from our district leadership team on April 4th. And then uh, for, 14th, excuse me. And then, and then we really are hoping on April 15th of this week to launch the family communication of the impact to this bill. Um, so that's the win. Um, this is how we're going to do this. So we're launching this on April 15th in the top eight languages in the in the district, we're going to have a fcps.net slash Senate Bill 128 landing site on our website where families in, and also an email address that families can reach out for questions. Uh, the dedicated landing page for our website will have, like I said, emails, uh, phone calls, uh, phone numbers, an FAQ document, talking points. Um, we're going to send out newsletters. Uh, just all, as you can see, we have videos of what the bill, the impact potentially, and trying to answer anticipated questions from our families. We're going to send backpack home, back, excuse me, backpack letters home with elementary students, and we will do mailings for middle and high. So the purpose of this is to really try to do our best to get the information of what parents and guardians' options are for their children. And, and those are the attempts in which we'll try to communicate with our with our community. Uh, the, the the it's it's a kind of a tricky because it's of the abstract idea of what the nature of what this bill is. So it, we really want to do a good job of trying to explain that and being proactive to do so. So these are the next steps. May first, um, the bill says that May first by we're we're going to set the date at the end of that day, uh, just to be fair to give as much time to our families to make their request. And it, really, what the request is is to let us know I am interested as a parent or guardian to have my child potentially uh, have a supplemental extra year do over year. Um, we'll then review that data on May 6th, give or take May 6th, um, to see the, the volume of, of requests. Um, we will then on May 10th um, present the data to the board and we will also um, uh, you know, look at any implications that we might foresee with the volume, potential volume, uh, and, and what we can do for for our community there. On, on May 24th is when we would ask that um, 
the board would take action. And here's here's the caveat to this. Depending on the volume of the requests or depending on what the board's wishes are in this, it's either you accept all of the requests or not, none of the requests. So that's, that's the specific um, clause there. It's all or none. I do want to make this statement, though, regardless of the all or none potential vote, the principal, and this is written in the guidance as well, still has the ability to, to retain a child where appropriate. So that, that, um, that tool that we use to sometimes use in cases where kids really need it for whatever the reason is still available to uh, make sure kids have their needs met. Um, by April 16th, we need to provide the waiver to the Board of Education, Kentucky Board of Education, um, depending 16th. on what you decided. Yeah, June 16th, sorry. <laughs> what did I say, May? Uh, June 16th. Oh, <laughs> April. Yeah, hey, June 16th. Sorry, stuck in April. June 16th. Um, okay, if you could um, go to the next one, please. Okay, so here's kind of in general some things as, you, as we get the data and collect it from our community that we will need to take in consideration. SBDM, once, if it were decided that uh, that we will accept all of the request, we will then probably likely have to look at our, our staffing allocations at the school level, depending on the volume for each building. And the SBDM will then be uh, the ones responsible for determining how best to use those funds, whether it's hiring another teacher or all, all the options are that SBDM would, would have at their disposal uh, it will be up to the SBDM to decide that. Um, so the decisions regarding promotion and, and retention, we need to really weigh um, weigh the benefits of that as we see the volume of this. Um, and, and really, you know, re there are a lot of studies that show that retention uh, may have a, a negative impact. So we want to we take that into consideration. I will tell you on the graduation rate, and this is also stated in the guidance, that this will negatively impact the, the graduation rate of schools. So as if we had um, students in the high school cohorts decide to stay back the year, um, they, they, it could potentially harm the graduation rate for a high school. Uh, funding is, is, a, is one of the things that we need to, that we will get uh, ADA funding for these students. Uh, we can use ESRA funds as well. Um, but the funding will be somewhat delayed because typically the way school funding operates, it's the following year. And so that's, that's something. Case say guidelines will still be an impact in uh, impacts of April. I think it's August 6th, 1st. Uh, if a child turns 19 by August 1st, they would not be eligible for their, for their fifth year of eligibility, which is what this uh, law also allows is for a student to repeat or to have their fifth year of eligibility in athletics. Uh, there are some restrictions on graduated students. If they graduate this year and choose to come back, um, it's really for retaking courses. It's not for additional um, certifications, nor would it impact their grade points. So it's uh, if they graduate, coming back is really just to get the experience of having a senior year. Um, it can, the, the retaking of the courses, the grades earned, can be noted on the transcript, but again, it wouldn't be impactful on their grade point. Obviously, we want to look at student needs when we're looking at the data, um, but specifically, um, it, depending on what the board decides on this, it really is, uh, we still have our at our disposal for a principal to review each individual student. And, and the, the benefit of collecting this data, no matter what's decided, the schools will have their students that have made the request or the parents have made the request, and we will do intentional outreach to those families to see what is their concern. Why are, why are you re requesting a potential supplemental year? And there might be other ways we can solve those issues without having to do a supplemental year. So it will, there, it will be useful uh, information. Um, one of the things we'll have to consider is a volume of student requests, and, and board member Spires touched on a point about our middle schools. If, if we had a particular bumper, uh, a, a bump of, of student enrollment at certain schools, it may or may be too difficult based on capacity. So, and that kind of leads me to the next point. Um, and then lastly, would be look at the long-term impact of retention and consider that when we're looking at the volume of requests. So um, those are just some things that we've kind of collected. Uh, to, that, again, none of this is really needed for tonight. We, I think when we go into the next meeting is when we'll really dive into the 
the volume of the data and, and having more of a collected uh, sense of where we're going with within our district. Um, yeah, Steve, I think it's important to just remind everyone who's listening that the site, everything will go live on the 15th. So don't don't you don't need to go looking for it this evening because it's not live. We want to make sure that our school leaders have an opportunity to weigh in on this. This is, you know, this is a pretty major piece of legislation that uh, came came down pretty quickly. So we are just now even getting uh, additional guidance and information from KDE with regard to it. So just be mindful, those of you that are listening, that the site will go live on the 15th. That is when you can go to get additional information. Mr. Hill, again, has done uh, an amazing job with his team, uh, including the Stephen Dahl and others to, you know, to read this legislation and to put it into a um, format that we all can understand it and appreciate it and hopefully follow it. Um, as he said, we will come back to you because I made the mistake earlier by saying uh, all of these items would uh, come, we would bring them back for action on the 26th. This is the one item that will not come back on the 26th for any action. We won't need to do that until this time next month after families have had an opportunity to uh, let us know um, their their wishes with regard to this this uh, legislation. So again, Mr. Hill, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there questions? Mr. Hill, you alluded to this, and one thing that I would ask, and, and I'm, I don't need an answer right now, but maybe one thing to think about as we continue this conversation. You mentioned our existing retainment policies and that administrators can work with families and students um, who might think that this would be in their best interest. So perhaps if we kind of um, can do a review of our existing retainment policies and see where those fit and what, um, if any changes might need to be made so that we could accommodate those requests and that that's just another option on the board's table. If that does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Certainly, we'll do that. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. And do you thank know? You board I'm sorry, Dr. Helm. Uh, Mr. Hill, you mentioned the impact on graduation rates. Has KDE mentioned anything about uh, an equalizer? Uh, because oftentimes graduation rates are incorporate, incorporated into accountability. Um, have they mentioned any type of effort to equalize like the districts who opt into this and the districts who opt out or is it just the numbers the number so i i don't have a great answer for that i do know that in the guidance it was suggested that they are they are aware of the i don't know about the equalizer but i know that they will take it into consideration uh knowing that this year is just a phenomenon and it will be for all those that adopt this thank you mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, at our regular meeting on April 26, we are going to be seeking your approval for our application to offer NTI if needed during the 21-22 school year. We're all probably hoping that we won't need it as much, but uh, we can. Uh, we would have up to 10 days available for us uh, to use uh, as needed. And so, uh, again, uh, Mr. Hill and our Chief Academic Officer, Kate McAnally, are gonna tell you a little bit about this. Thank you, Superintendent Helm. And we'll move into our slides here. So board members, this is a new um, application that is actually now created by the Kentucky Department of Education as part of the Comprehensive District Improvement Plan. And they're calling this the phase four. So this is why it looks a little different uh, perhaps to you uh, than in the past in that it is replacing the former NTI application in its place now in, in um, the comprehensive district improvement plans across the state. So beginning with the application for the upcoming school year, uh, districts were asked to submit a diagnostic which they call the continuation of learning plan. This is the replacement that you have before you. It, approving this application board members 
gives us the right to use up to 10 NTI days next school year, but it does not require us to use those. So again, I'm reinforcing um, comments made by Superintendent Helm at our introduction. And Steve, Steve Hill will also be joining me in our presentation tonight. So one of the structures that some of the districts around the around the state when they implement uh, NTI for weather or implement weather for community illness, they set parameters such as is one of the things we wanted to look at is look um, not not utilizing NTI until possibly missing the third day of school. In other words, if we have one in November, just go ahead and call a call a weather day and waiting till that third day that will also put um, help our our teachers prepare long term for when they might potentially have to flip a, a snow day into an NTI day. Um, learning objectives will be aligned with our current and previously learned content. In other words, we won't introduce new material. We'll do current review of what's being taught or what has been taught in the past. And uh, every grade, grade level in school will align the NTI learning objectives with their current pacing guide documents. So um, so hopefully we'll all be on the same page when we do, uh, if we decide to use NTI as a tool, so. And board members, the um, delivery of instruction will be uh, mostly in the primary method of a digital delivery. Uh, if we do, in fact, need to use one of our NTI days, uh, packets will be used only if uh, technology is not as uh, uh, not available or feasible, such as if there's a power outage. A learning management system, which is either Google or Canvas in Bay County Public Schools will be utilized to outline that coursework and to facilitate that learning process for our students. And of course, digital lessons uh, will be created, updated, revised, and shared with students instantaneously. Um, I would like to share some additional information with you board members regarding our students um, with an IEP as well as other students with specialized plans in the next several slides. Uh, first, about supporting special education students and to the greatest extent possible during an NTI day, each of the students uh, will be provided that special education and related services identified in the individual education plan. Um, and if during NTI there's a student uh, who does not receive their IEP uh, service, then the Admissions and uh, Release Committee, or commonly called the ARC, will make an individual determination to decide whether um, that particular student is uh, in need of and requiring compensatory education services. That ARC may meet uh, by teleconference or other means. And the students uh, who have a other specific plans, such as our English learners, our gifted and talented students, and students uh, with the 504 plans, uh, student, the teachers may, as appropriate, they may modify the content lesson, um, they may create student-specific activities or, and or assignments, uh, they may individualize the virtual instruction, contact the students uh, regularly, uh, and or provide student specific accommodations. Uh, I'm going to speak to the uh, student participation and how we will monitor um, that as if we choose to um, implement NTI. So just we will do kind of very similar to what we've done before by we can monitor whether students are participating using the online coursework. Uh, we can always check the, the um, development of students as they're progressing through the online assignments. Um, we can also accept participation through project or paper assignments. So let's say um, we called a we called a day an NTI day and a student didn't by chance bring home their um, their device. Uh, we can always have them do the makeup work with uh, similarly aligned uh, activities. Uh, through a paper project if, and, and still assign them participation. Um, and also, you just like I said before, it's participating in the instructional activities. And on a side note, we are working towards trying to, one, one of the things different is, that we did um, is using Infinite Campus for our teachers to be able to log the participation because it's something they're already familiar with doing and it's a great way to collect 
that data. Um, I've already spoken with our IC department, so we're working towards that as the goal um, to make the data collection piece a little easier as we uh, progress. So, uh, the next slide, please. So, how will we monitor staff participation? Honestly, it's as students are participating, the, the teachers will be recording and also teaching. Um, that would be a measure of staff participation. We certainly want our teachers to, to communicate high expectations uh, with the learning and participation for our students when and if we do use NTI. Um, we want to make sure our teachers are planning using standard-based teaching. Uh, we want, I think, one area, and we can all agree on this, I believe, we have really strengthened our skills as a teaching force in the virtual learning. And mm -hmm. that's one thing I think we're, we can, I'll go ahead and say, I think we're pretty much experts at that at this point. So, um, and I think our students equally are experts in, in, and our families are experts in participating in digital learning. And that kind of speaks to the concerns of learning in a virtual setting. Uh, we've learned things that we can't even measure maybe. And this is one of them is our ability to be comfortable with virtual uh, setting at home with our teachers. So that's an, that's an awesome thing that's come out of COVID. Um, and providing feedback for great appropriate assignments. We wanna make sure uh, that if students are struggling with the concept, the great thing about using NTI is if, because it's a review, oftentimes of reviewed work, if we see a child is struggling with the concept that maybe they should have picked up previously, we can certainly address those uh, issues as, as we go through NTI. Okay, that thing, the next one. We'll be glad to entertain any questions you may have, board members. Uh, I have a question, uh, Mr. Murphy. Uh, can uh, Mr. Hill or Ms. McAnally, do we, do we feel like we have the technology to support um, the plan that you've uh, outlined? So this uh, plan had multiple um, members uh, to help create it. Uh, we do have Amy Johns present tonight who can help um, specifically address that uh, question uh, regarding uh, technology. Uh, Board Member Jones, yes, and I think Bob Moore is with us as well, so he may want to chime in. But um, basically, this last year, if anything, has proven um, at this point that we do have the technology in place and we are in the process of uh, planning for refreshes for the upcoming year. Um, one of the things that's going to be very important is that we build in a plan that will allow us to continue this cycle. We've, we've gotten to one-to-one, -one, but if we're going to stay there, then we definitely have to plan for that and everything that's involved in making that work. And so um, that work is going on now to identify the needs for the upcoming school year, uh, but we should be in a good place that we can continue just like we have in the current school year. Uh, Mr. Jones, I also wanted to speak to, so I think our presenting this and putting it as part of this plan is really, uh, it's a tool. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll use it. It's just there and available to us in case we need it. Also, um, one of the discussions we've had, let's say we are on a win we're, we're Wednesday uh, in the middle of winter and we know a winter storm's coming Thursday and Friday. It may be something we take a preemptive call, making sure everybody takes home their devices, being prepared for an NTI day for that Thursday and Friday. So it can be used even in a planned kind of setting. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're addressing the question concern that kids might forget their device and then then what do you do? But I think it can be really used on a planned or, or we were two years ago, we had to take two days due to illness and um, and it would have been a way we could have said, hey, let's flip those two days to, um, to an NTI, clean, you know, do a good job of maybe separating kids for about four days to get illness away from the buildings. And uh, let's, let's go ahead and have everybody take home their devices on Wednesday night. So there's, there's multiple ways we can use this and it's just a tool at this point. And I will say, you know, it's a big if, right? <laughs> if we need to use it. And NTI has really, um, just because this was our first year with it, don't judge NTI, which is traditionally NTI, by what we've experienced under the era of COVID. Um, 
you know, I, I've taught in districts that used NTI for the previous six years when it was first available, when it was kind of what Mr. Hill was talking about. If you have a weather day, you use it and it's mainly review and those types of things. And you, and it depends on how we implement it. Each district implements it differently, but there's usually also some grace uh, time, the grace period, right? Because it is review. Um, if, if a child runs into a technological issue, um, there'll be opportunities to, to get that work done without any type of penalty or anything like that. So the advantage of this type of NTI is there is some flexibility built into that. So we're not as dependent on that technology as we've been in this, uh, in this COVID environment. And to give my, to give the new board members kind of some backstory too, as to why we as Fayette County did not do this in years past, like Boyle County and some other counties is we really had concerns surrounding um, children with IEPs and 504s and the services provided to those children. And so um, we've learned a lot and I think we're moving forward, but I think that's also why we're saying this is an option and this is a tool, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to implement it, um, especially like that first day, because if there's one day, it may not be worth all the the stuff we need to do to make up those plans and those things as well. So I want to give you all kind of a historical data as to why larger districts are less likely to implement NTI than some of the smaller districts across the state. During COVID, I know that we offered the hotspots. What did we do with those hotspots? Did they stay with the families? Um, are those still going to be accessible to kids? That would just be my biggest concern that we, I know that we have the Chromebooks one per child, but that when children don't have internet, it, it's just stressful. You know, my internet went out for a few days and we got a few days behind on NTI and, you know, it, it's, you just don't want to put that stress on families in an already stressful situation. So I just hope if, if we're going to consider, consider NTI that we also consider, you know, do our kids have access to internet because it's not, it's not equitable if, unless we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. I had one quick question, Dr. Helm. Um, this was on page 90 of, <laughs> of the agenda, and it was just a quick note, it talked about community partners. And there was a line that kind of caught my attention. I was excited, and this might, this isn't super, related to NTI, but it said the Community Action Council 
is partnering, partnering with SCPS to host a free community-wide implicit bias virtual symposium. And I didn't know when that information was available, if it could be shared, because I know um, lots of community members have reached out to me personally asking if this opportunity was going to be made available to families. Um, so I just saw that little line there, and I'm just looking forward to hearing more information um, on that nugget. All right, we will get you some additional information on page 90 at item uh, the Community Action Council. We'll get you some additional information. Thank you. At the regular meeting, uh, Mr. Rodney Jackson will uh, provide you with a, an update on the monthly financial reports. And um, as he does so well each month, the next two items are the next two strategic actions that we think are critical uh, to take with regards to our challenges uh, with, uh, within transportation. So uh, the, the very next item is the, um, um, I've lost my place. The next two items are the um, salaries for classified hourly and the uh, job description for a recruitment and retention specialist. So I will turn the first item over to uh, Ann Sampson Grimes, and then the second item to uh, Ms. Steyer and Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Helm. I'll uh, jump in and let Ann um, sort of jump in as well. Uh, as you mentioned, and as we have previously discussed, we're actively trying to address our bus driver shortage through various strategies. Uh, Long-term compensation has been identified as a factor uh, for recruiting and retaining drivers. But not only for our bus drivers, it's true for all of our classified staff uh, to include but not be limited to our monitors, our plumbers, our electricians, our HVAC technicians. Uh, basically, people applying to the district from outside can only bring in four years of outside experience. And by contrast, on the certified or salaried side, people can bring up to 20 years of experience. So it's been very difficult uh, to bring in classified staff who have outside experience as the pay is just not competitive. And we're proposing to uh, lift that requirement going forward, uh, effective May 1st for all new hires and July 1, uh, any current employees who have eligible experience would be able to uh, request a review of that. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to add or we'll see if the board has any questions. No, sir, do you all have any questions? We have a rough ballpark on um, fiscal impact. We do. Um, it could be anywhere in the ballpark of three million up to five million. There's a lot of factors involved when calculating the numbers. Um, so those are our best estimates given the information that we currently have at hand. And Anna, I think you and John will have that as part of the budget uh, work session. Work session for the board. Yes, sir. And just to clarify, Mr. Thompson, so this brings the classified. Um, experience uh, eligibility to par with uh, certified, right? It's the just 20 years. Uh, yes, sir. That is correct. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so this uh, is being considered at the same time that we're considering budget, or is this separate from the district budget planning and so forth? Is that no? The same same time, same time. Okay. As, as, uh, as he said, it will be included in either the uh, budget work session on Thursday the 15th or the budget work session on the 22nd, both of which are from 4 to 6 p.m. It is a, um, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a policy. We would have to make the policy, is it a policy, the four years, but it's a policy change that has a fiscal impact or is it just a practice? Procedure. I think it's Jennifer. <laughs> you know. I don't know that it is in the, oh, in the procedure. I will double check. We'll look at that. Keon Massey is here, our Associate Director of uh, Classified Staff. She's been championing this for a long time, so I know that she's yeah. anxious for this as well. Um, but we will, I don't think it's in policy. I do think there's something in the procedure. 
that okay. we would need to address once approved. And Jennifer, it's on the actual salary schedule itself too. I don't know if that's the codification, but I'll let you research that and get that back. To the Absolutely. And the salary schedule is something that you all approve, just like when we've made changes to other um, items, that that would be something that would uh, would be approved at the, or requesting that be approved at the regular meeting. Mm -hmm. I, I think that this is, you know, I've talked it, in conversations with classified folks, you know, this is a frequent topic of conversation and Ms. Massey, I'm sure here's the same thing, um, you know, and they're, they're the unsung heroes, right? We call them ESPs, Education Support Professionals. I say that stands for they make every school possible. Um, so uh, recruiting and retaining them, we've learned in this era of COVID is, is key. It's key. All right, um, the, <clears throat> the job description for the recruitment and retention specialist position, Ms. Dyer and Mr. Thompson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Helm. And again, this is just trying to stay ahead of the staffing curve. <laughs> uh, just in terms of onboarding, uh, we are looking at targeted outreach for our unique positions because many are so unique and nuanced that our blanketed approach, just sort of casting wide nets uh, having someone to really engage full time in terms of tracking and reporting on various statistics and uh, just other employment related data on any prospects or applicants and providing that information to various department heads and sort of making sure that we keep uh, our staffing levels at appropriate um, levels uh, to support our schools. And again, it goes beyond that in terms of retaining once we get people onboarded, uh, making sure that we're uh, conducting and uh, tracking their training and professional development opportunities. Uh, doing stay interviews. We, we often try to interview people when they're leaving, but we want to engage people to figure out, you know, what's important to you about working for Fayette County Public Schools and then strengthening, strengthening uh, those retention strategies as well. And then lastly, just offboarding. If we're losing people, uh, we want to know why. And a lot of times it's just better opportunities, but if there are things that we need to be evaluating internally uh, to make the work environment more um, encompassing uh, across the district, uh, this person would have those duties. And I think that we've done a, a good job of trying to focus that again on the certified side. And this would be an emphasis on the classified side as well. Myron covered it. <laughs> so is this a new position? Yes, sir, yes. it is a new position. Have we seen similar things in, in peer districts? Um, or, or similar size districts. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, Jennifer, go ahead, please. As I say, in other districts our size and larger, there's usually a full team. We've had one recruiter, uh, the uh, which is Rose Santiago right now, but normally there's more of a almost like a recruiting department that's within um, human resources. There are that talent acquisition. Um, this would really help uh, us broaden our net. And again, uh, retention is one of the keys. And uh, we would love for us to be able to have this position to assist with that retention um, of our staff. Once re recruiting and, and those touch points to get them here are one thing, but if we can't keep them, then th that's a whole other issue that, and it becomes cyclical. So we, it's definitely something that um, is a need and would be in par with the district our size. It would still be considered small. Um, when we've had our uh, previous audits in years past, that's always been a question that uh, when we get interviewed from whether it's our um, diagnostics reviews or different audits, that's a question that we get asked um, every time. Why, why should this uh, be something that is not delayed until we have our new superintendent in place? Uh, Mr. Jones, just what's the, what, what's the compelling reason for doing this now as opposed to doing it after the new superintendent is hired? Uh, yes, sir. From my lens and standpoint, uh, again, trying to fill these bus driver positions has sort of bubbled up uh, an urgent need to get that situation addressed for summer school, which was mentioned earlier, and to make sure that we're ready to hit the ground in the fall. Uh, we could delay this, uh, but again, that would push us into the fall semester in terms of getting someone acclimated and onboarded and necessarily um, maybe missing out on some applicants that would be ready to service. Um, but uh, that is the need. And then we are having issues not only within transportation. I know that is the hot button issue right now, but we are losing, uh, again, electricians, plumbers, skilled trade positions. 
And I think just trying to be able to uh, get folks onboarded in a timely manner uh, for this fall is my compelling reason for why now versus later. Um, but I'll let Ms. Dyer or anyone else weigh in as well. Our hiring window for the fall opens Saturday. So if we postpone this until we get a superintendent on board and in place, um, it isn't going to be able to have an impact on the fall. Thank you, Ms. Dyer and Mr. Thompson. So we will bring this back to you on the 26th for action. And again, it will be included. Question, um, on the agenda, I didn't see the fiscal impact. So do we know what that is? It's on the summary. It should be at the bottom of the summary and it's estimated uh, 75,000. It's on, it's on the summary page of that. Thank you. And this will be included in your um, considerations for uh, your budget work sessions as well. So um, you'll see this again. So our last item for- I, I'm uh, sorry, did you, say, did you say that this would be a part of the budget conversation as well? Yes. Okay, thanks. Our last item for discussion this evening is the approval of a contract for monitoring uh, social media and um, Ms. Steffendahl is going to give a brief uh, overview uh, of that. Ms. Steffendahl. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Good evening, board members, and thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. At our action meeting on April 26th, we will ask the board to approve a contract for social media monitoring, which is part of our comprehensive 10-point safety investment plan. And since we have several school board members who may not be familiar with our social media monitoring process, I wanted to just provide some brief background information. Um, you may recall that the District Safety Advisory Council was convened in 2018 following the tragic school shootings in Marshall County, Kentucky and Parkland, Florida. However, the resulting safety investment plan was designed to not only prevent a school shooting, but to also mitigate the other risks our students face, including bullying, self-harm, suicide, drug use, and online exploitation. Um, Amy, if you'll move to the next slide. The proliferation of social media use among young people is well-documented, and we all, I think, um, know that our students are more connected than any previous generation. According to the Pew Research Center, 95% of teens uh, ages 14 to 17 have access to a personal smartphone. 45% describe their online activity as constantly. 72% are active on Instagram. 69% are active on Snapchat. 51% on Facebook, and 32% on Twitter. Knowing that our students are living their lives online, it's critical for us to be paying attention. And there have been too many tragedies nationally where authorities have learned too late that there were actually warning signs online prior to uh, the tragic consequences. One of the top, cons uh, as a result of that, that was one of the top recommendations from the District Safety Advisory Council that we should consider contracting with an external partner for social media monitoring. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, Amy. One of the beauties of the company that we contract with, um, it's the, the company is called Social Sentinel. They have existing contracts with all of the different social media um, platforms. So they automatically receive all public posts and they come through those public posts with an algorithm that they use. They have an um, artificial intelligence that looks through it and narrows those um, posts down to only begin to highlight those that have some sort of a threat for harm. Then they look to see if those posts are associated with their clients. So to determine who would be associated with our school district, they would look at 
people who have liked our social media content, people who follow us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, people who mention our schools regularly in their posting. They also do some location, um, but unlike some companies that will only use a, something they call a geo code, where they only look at a certain targeted area, because we know that threats can come from anywhere nationally, they they use location afterward. It's not the first the, the first path of how they cut down that information. Once they match us with a potential threat for harm, then they classify what type of threat it is, and they give us a um, we we get a, an online alert. Next slide, Amy. So these are some of the specific types of harm that they would flag for us. They would look for indications of self-harm, of harm to others, of sexual violence, mental health awareness, wet general wellness, harassment, or substance abuse. And the next for me, please, Amy. Okay. Oh, she's back. Sorry about that. I thought that the public couldn't see. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so one of the things that um, makes this product um, really help us to reduce staff time is that if we were doing the scanning um, ourselves, we would have to be flagging keywords. So say, for example, we had flagged the word bomb. We would pick up posts that are similar to what we have online here, where that movie was the bomb or that taco was the bomb or I bombed the test. Uh, what we really want is the one that says I have a pipe bomb or, you know, I mean, we don't want that, but that would be the type of alert that we would want flagged rather than all of those others. And so this company actually does the work for us and they only give us the posts that we really do need to pay attention to. So to give you kind of an example, they have scanned in the past year, 292,105 posts that had a potential for harm that were also linked to our district and 26,064 photos. They alerted us to 202 situations that we should look into. And what happens then is we have a team of people from our student support office and our law enforcement office and myself and we all bring our own lens. So I look at it from a PR perspective. Our uh, student support services folks look at it from a, a mental health issue or a self-harm or um, perspective. And then our law enforcement are looking for a threat against um, a, you know, people or property. And um, then we have an online platform where we discuss those behind the scenes and, um, and we, we discuss next steps. So I know that I don't have the final contract for you all. This is the third year of a, the, the, uh, this is our possibility to renew a third year of a three-year contract. And um, by doing that, we were able to keep the price flat over the entire time period. And so the contract, which I should have to upload for board members by Friday, would be for $71,871.55. This is already included in the 2020 budget for the safety tax. Any questions? Yeah. Ms. Dethanol, thank you very much. Do, do we have any um, um, data or examples of um, uh, the benefits that we've we've gained in the time that we've used the, the program some uh, specific examples that we can share or just even allude, allude to i know we have to be careful of not getting too many specifics but uh yes sir uh we actually um had a student who was uh sharing ideations of um s some violent thoughts and um were able to intervene in that situation uh, get some uh, support placed around that student and um, get them connected. Um, they were feeling very isolated and um, very angry um, about their peers 
And um, so we were able to uh, overcome that. And then um, we also had a student who was actively um, considering uh, death by suicide. And um, we were able to identify that student and get them the help. And um, they are with us today. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? So this, this is not something that has to be a bid. Sorry, this is not something that has to be bid. I, this is actually a proprietary software and we are purchasing it from a, a national co-op that we belong to. So it's already been through the procurement process, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Unless there are no other questions, um, board members on tonight's agenda, there are four informational items. The four items that we see each month, the school activity fund report, personnel changes for April, budget transfer report, and the position control document. Um, at this time, I will turn the meeting back over to Chair Murphy with the notation that there is not a need for a closed session this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Uh, anything else from board members before we prepare to adjourn? Okay, a motion is in order at this time to make the agenda dated April 12th, 2021 on which action has been taken to this meeting a part of the minutes as if copied in the minutes verbatim. Is there a motion to that effect? Send it. Motion by board member Spires, a second by board member Morris. Uh, any discussion? The motion is on making the agenda part of the minutes uh, verbatim. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And at this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this special meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education. And before I entertain that motion, I want to again thank our special guest um, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you back on the 26th, uh, Ms. Traub, Ms. Uh, Graham, and uh, Caitlin. Thank you all so much for being here. We appreciate your time this evening. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. We'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Motion by board member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Morris. The motion is on adjournment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We'll now adjourn. Thank you all very much. Thank you.